when did priests become a requirement for the Eucharist? Okay, now this, this is coming from left of field, Rob, isn't it? What, what's, I wonder what's brought that question to light. It's not in response to anything in particular, is it? When did priests become a requirement for the Eucharist? That's a very good question, isn't it? The answer is I've got no idea. I mean, when, when did priests come into being as a sort of class? You know, when did the church clericalize? I remember reading, oh, what was that book? C.K. C. K. Barrett's book, on um, which looked at the origins of, of uh, church organization and pointed out that it sort of seems to have developed organically because the, the word for um, priest, presbyteros, is literally in Greek elder, isn't it? So we assume who sort of who started to take leadership in the church early on? The older people. You know, and then you get diakonos, which just means servant. And so you get servants and you get elders, and then gradually those things evolve into sort of fixed positions. Tom is with us. Excellent. Welcome, brother. Eid Mubarak. <laughs> Eid Mubarak, Tom. Okay, he can't even hear us. Okay, now he can hear us. Salam, we're, everyone. We're, How are we? Well, I'm busy giving you Eid, giving Eid Mubarak, brother. Thank you. Thank you. And you. And you. It's thank wonderful. You, I always, we always seem to do this at, at very auspicious occasions. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. <laughs> now, hang, hang on. We're in the middle of this, um, a couple of conversations here. But we'll... But before we do, Tom, just tell us the significance of uh, the day in the Islamic calendar. So t today uh, signifies uh, what is called the Eid, and Eid means celebration uh, of Al Adha, and Al Adha is the sacrifice. So today marks the end of the uh, the Islamic pilgrimage uh, to Hajj to Mecca. So um, so now is when it's all sort of ending and, 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 and culminating. So at the end of all that, uh, there is the feast, or not the feast, but the celebration of the sacrifice in which uh, those that attend Hajj and those all around the world will sacrifice a, you know, either uh, a, a, any sort of animal, uh, a, a, any sort of a farm animal that is then given to the poor uh, to, so that they can have their, their sustenance from that. Wow. So we're wrong because we thought this was associated with the Abraham Ishmael um, uh, connection. That, that's that exactly was... correct. No, you're oh, absolutely right. You're absolutely okay. right. Uh, so, so the, the the pilgrimage, and of course, th that's that's the wonderful thing about uh, about the commonality of our faiths is that we 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 take all of these um, uh, all of these instances in history, and and they're actually part and parcel of our own faith as well. So yes, no, definitely there is a there is a, a linkage to that, uh, but the sacrifice in itself, yes, is to commemorate that particular incident, but also as a recognition of the poor uh, and the giving of sustenance to the poor. Fantastic. Is it all is it all given to the poor, or is it portioned out in different ways? It's uh, well, I mean, you, what a lot of people uh, sign up for these days is that there are. Sort of, for example, in Lebanon, there, there, there are obviously a lot of poor, poor people living in in the villages and stuff. So there will be organisations that are set up in Lebanon in which you can donate to, and then whatever money they collect is however money they is, is whatever money they use then to to organise uh, the amount of heads of cattle or sheep or chickens or whatever it is, yep. and they sacrifice those and they and they and they uh, hand them out. Um, but of course, you know, if you have uh, if you have local people that, that are in need as well, then it's incumbent on us to give to them. And it doesn't always have to culminate in a um, in a you know in the, in the handing out of meat. It, it could culminate in handing out of funds or wh whatever the case may be, wow. so that they can live a better life. Now, I, I, no, I noticed a disturbing comment here from Robert, uh, which you might be able to help us with here, Tom. Yes. Sir. You see it there on the screen? Yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, surely, I guess there's... Probably the, the animal can be a part of it. Oh, in fact, in fact, it is so incredibly antithetical to the faith 
yes. that it, it, it beggars belief that this sort of thing can still go on. And of course, nobody's suggesting that it didn't happen. I'm sure what, what our friend here is describing actually did occur. And that, of course, comes down to the in ignorance of particular individuals. But in fact, without sort of taking too much time away from what we're doing today to explain this, but really in Islam, I mean, you cannot even slaughter an animal in front of another animal for fear Is that, that right? it will it will it will scare the other animal right and when you do slaughter an animal it has to be done in one motion so that the death is almost instantaneous right yeah. right you actually so, yeah. have to provide water to an animal that you're about to slaughter it cannot die thirsty so it has to be humane it has to be absolutely humane now I like our friend here, and I didn't catch his name, I'm sorry. Uh, Robert. Robert, did you say? Yeah. yeah. So I, like Robert, have seen horrifying instances of where people are just incredibly inhumane and cruel to, to animals in the name of religion and all that. And I, I think it's it's disgusting. I really do. Yeah. But it's certainly not the tenant of the faith. And that's that's where we have to be very careful to not... No, draw... no, no. I, th I think we've all seen good examples of hypocrisy in one... No hypocrisy has never been limited to one religion absolutely and unfortunately it's a human condition isn't it mm -hmm. now just a couple of other comments i wanted to follow up and hear from the timeline here we've got jeff um i've been told the world will we will go out of the world and will close down and the world will go into darkness for 11 days i'm not sure who told you jeff wasn't me <laughs> so, so I don't mean to be cynical because it's a. Uh, I appreciate we, we seem to be in apocalyptic times in many ways, and there are lots of um, dire predictions going around. Inshallah, they won't um, all come to pass, but it's hard to know. I mean, look, well, we, I, yeah. I, I think there's a. There's a beautiful uh, saying for Imam Ali alayhi salam, and, and this I think goes to all people that think about these things. And I think our friend here is, I think it's a good thing to be thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but Imam Ali alayhi salam says that live your life here on earth as though you're going to live forever. And he says, live your life here on earth in terms of the afterlife as though you're going to die tomorrow. Yeah. Right. So where's that, where's that from, Tom? So Imam, this is one of the sayings of Imam Ali. It's it's in a in collection of uh, it's 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 in a collection of works from a book called Nahjul Balagha, which is the peak of eloquence. And uh, the, Imam Ali's uh, sayings and sermons were actually documented in a book. Funny enough, actually, by a Sunni scholar. Uh, so so Nahjul Balagha is actually collated by a Sunni scholar. Uh, which is a wonderful thing, of course. And uh, but yeah, that's one of his very profound sayings. You know, live your life on earth as though you're going to live forever. Meaning, save and work hard and do all the things that you want to do. Have children, live a good life. But think about your life on earth as the, in terms of your afterlife, as though you're going to die tomorrow. Meaning, let it always be front of mind, and so that you're always doing the right thing and doing the good thing. Powerful. Powerful, and and I'm just I'm delighted to hear it because it kind of it ties in with um, I think a certain amount of current thinking about you know for among Christians uh, I think Tom Wright might have might have touched on this about you know the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven um, is not something that you know we sort of you know we're going to afterwards the kingdom of heaven should start here and now in, in our lives and the way Absolutely. we do it. Absolutely. I, I, I very much agree with that. And I think the the kingdom of heaven as such is is really what is manifest in us and what is manifest in what we do. Um, you know, it, there's no use waiting for something to happen. We have to make it happen. You know, yeah. there's no use waiting for the end of poverty. We can ensure that somebody that we know doesn't live in poverty anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this is, these are the things that are incumbent on us. And I think that's a commonality amongst all our faiths, all the monotheistic faiths. Good morning, Diane. Morning, Diane. <laughs> that's right. We, we had another helpful text here from Jeff who posted up the uh, verses from Revelation 16 
that was motivating, that's the source of the uh, idea about the darkness. Now, I appreciate there are a number of prophecies in Revelation like that, which uh, uh, give us visions, foreboding uh, images uh, of what's to come, whether they're to come literally in that form and whether they're to come in within our lifetime, that's the question. I don't know. I mean, my dad used to say it's like waves on the beach, you know what I mean, that these sorts of terrible things, wars and famine and pestilence, etc., come like waves and eventually there'll be a great wave, you know, that'll, that'll be the final wave. Mm. But in the meantime, it's very hard to know whether we're dealing with the little ones or the big one. I think from an Islamic context, we again, it's it's about bringing it back to the moment in which we exist. And, and there's a wonderful um, supplication that we have in which uh, in which we ask God to, to not take us back until he is satisfied with us. <clears throat> so increase my life until you are satisfied with me. And when you're satisfied That's with good. me, take me back. That's fine. That's beautiful. Um, and, and I think, you know, in, in relation to, you know, to the thought of the end of the world and, and all that sort of thing, let's just hope that if and when it does happen, God is satisfied with us. Beautifully put, brother. I'm going to just one more comment I don't want to miss over from Robert, who said that my son is doing baptismal, baptismal studies with the Greek Orthodox. They insist on a priest being involved in everything. This comes back to his earlier point of when did, when did we ever move into having established a priesthood? in the church and as I say, I mean, my reading influenced by C.K. Barrett was it just sort of happened organically over time. But yeah, the establishment of a order of clergy as a sort of fixed um, order, uh, we don't know. I think it sort of evolved more organically with the older people being in charge. And yes, but then now we reach a point where unless you have a priest involved, gosh, you can't do anything. It, it's much the same in the Islamic system, isn't it, brother, uh, Tom? Look, it, it is on an institutional level, but if you look at some of the most important um, institutions that we have in Islam, then they don't require the clergy. For example, marriage. If the situation was dire enough that I couldn't find a sheikh or I couldn't find a sayyid to get married, I could get married on my own. I don't need them wow. because religion is such an, uh, sorry, marriage is such an important institution in Islam that nothing should be able to get in its way. So even if you don't have access to uh, a, a clergyman, then you can still perform the rites yourself. So, but of course, nobody does because there's, you, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a clergyman these days. Um, <laughs> But but if the situation arose, then it, it wouldn't be necessary. Salam, Joy. It's wonderful to see you. Morning, Joy. Afternoon. All right. If this is good. Um, it's pro probably time we made a, a, an official uh, start. We're about 15 minutes late. Brings back memories. <laughs> Indeed. It's interesting too. Not my fault this, again. No, no, no. It, it's interesting <laughs> that this... Um, issue about the role of clergy is going to come up in our Torah reading. Yes. Which Tom's going to give us. I'm going to, I have to go. find it. I haven't, I haven't yet found it. So you, let me do you, that while you, you guys are talking now. All right. You've got a few minutes now. I'm going Good. to remove you so that you can. Thank start you. Start searching the Torah. And you too. So, uh, this is Amos seven from seven to 17. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall, shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from 
his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judea, earn your bread there, and prophecy there. But never again shall prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Am Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of the sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from, from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophecy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus says the Lord, Your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in the unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. Thanks be to God. Actually, thanks be to God isn't really a good way to conclude that reading. It's a, it's a rather miserable prophecy, isn't it? But uh, it, it does pick up on what we were talking earlier about the role of professional clergy, because this is Amaziah. He, he's the official high priest of uh, Samaria. And he says, you know, go back home. You, you, you're not a, you know, because uh, Amos is, is from the south, from, from Judah. He's not even a local. What gives you the right to speak? And he's not a, he's not a cleric. He says, I'm not a prophet or a prophet's son. Mm. I'm nobody. A dresser of sycamore trees. It's a farmer. But God's called him to come and prophesy in the north out of his own territory. Uh, why? We don't know. I mean, why couldn't God find someone up north and why couldn't it have been a, a properly ordained official that uh, people would listen to? But um, that's the way God worked in that particular case. Oh, we've got Doug with us. Good to have you, brother. Sorry, I'll remove that. Amos, the plumb line. Any more? Any, any thoughts, guys? The plumb line is something that builders use, isn't it? Yeah, and I suppose it's is that the idea is it's something that keeps you straight. That's that the right? idea. Yeah, yeah the, yeah. the house of Israel, if you like, is falling over. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the uh, metaphor. So, yes, th things are not straight as they should be. I mean, the problem we've got here in this particular reading from Amos is it doesn't give us any content. I, mean, I love Amos as a book because it's the, for, for us, sort of social justice warriors, it's the sort of clearest example of, of um, in the Torah of, of, of uh, prophecies that address the needs of, of the poor. So, you know, you go back to Amos chapter chapters 1 and 2, which begins with Amos sort of standing on the in the street corner there in Samaria at the marketplace saying for three sins of uh, the various nations around them and for four where he's decrying the sins of the foreign nations and then he attacks uh, southern Judah and then he zeroes in on Israel. And why? Because you, what is it, you trample the heads of the needy, you sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, you that trample on the heads of the poor, you know, and... Um, you, you get these series of uh, attacks. I mean, it's not only their uh, exploitation of, of the weak, but and you know there are sexual sins and other things mixed in there. But particularly, what you get from Amos is this uh, crusade against the exploitation of the poor. So you know you get the issues. They sit in the house of their God on the on the garments of those that have been taken in loans. The idea that you've got people giving loans to the poor at, you know, exorbitant interest rates and they're taking their garment as a pledge, which you're allowed to do, but then you have to give the garment back at night time so that the person, the poor person had something to keep them warm. And the, the image Amos gives is these people going into the temple to pray and sitting on these garments, you know, ultimate form of hypocrisy, uh, which is something we brought up a bit earlier as well. Then in Amos chapter 4, you've got Amos's... Um, attack on the, the cultured women of Samaria, where he calls them the cows, you cows of Bashan. 
who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. You know, in other words, there you've got people who aren't probably explicitly exploiting the poor, but um, they're just profiting from a system that that exploits the poor. And, uh, you know, Amos has terrible prophecies for them too. So that's, that's the greater context, which I think we miss. Uh, you know, it's all tales of... of uh, hellfire and brimstone but behind that is, is Amos's uh, prophetic message that they, that the society has failed to look after the vulnerable mm. uh, on the contrary has exploited uh, the poor and, and is, I think I think that goes back to what we were discussing before because I think this idea that we need we need a clergy, to be told to be good people is, is almost ridiculous, isn't it? Because, you know, there are things, I mean, in, in Islam, we believe that, that our connection to God is innate. So God has placed something in our hearts, which in Arabic we call futra. And futra is something, is an innate connection with God. So to think that we need to be told that something is, right or something is good or something is evil is almost a bit silly and nonsensical so it's interesting that uh, and i'm sorry i i can't remember the name but it's interesting that this this herder that has come that, that that says i'm not a prophet and i'm you know i think it's logical because you shouldn't need a clergyman to be able to to, to be told that look we can be better as individuals not just to ourselves but actually to other people to treat them with with dignity and to give them the the the, the level of um, dignity that 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 we expect for ourselves. So I think this whole thing, and and I see this a lot in the Islamic community, you know, and it, it, this might be a little bit sort of a bit a bit of a roundabout way to discuss things, but I always talk to people and they they love bashing into the clergy and saying, well, they don't do this and they don't provide that and they don't. And my answer to them always is, well, why aren't you doing it? You know, if this is such an important thing to you, why are you waiting for somebody in a turban to come and do it? Why can't you do it? Mm, mm, mm. You know, and I, I think this is where a lot of people sort of, it's a bit of excuse making, you know, I, oh, well, you know, if I was the clergy, this is what I would do. Well, you don't have to be the clergy. You can still do it. You're touching on very important points there, Tom. Uh, I mean, the whole idea that we actually know what's right to begin with. That's right. But at the same time, the reality of revelation in both our spiritual traditions is uh, the and the priority of revelation is um, testimony to the fact that while we might know deep down what's right, we're pretty good at forgetting. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> if, not, if, if not forgetting, at deceiving ourselves, we need people to come and remind us of the truth that we already know. And in fact, in the Quran, there is a dialogue that occurs between God and the devil. And the devil says to God, he says, I'm going to wait for them, meaning us. He doesn't say I'm going to wait for them on the peripheries and I'm going to pick them off the site. No, no. He says, I'm going to wait for them on your straight and narrow path. And that's where he's going to try to pick us up. You know, so yes, of course, and I, I say that because, well, I mean, this is where that reminder is so helpful because we may think we're on the straight and narrow path, but sometimes somebody might see something that we don't see ourselves. And uh, and it's interesting, you know, I mean, I, I, th I think this is very similar to what we've just discussed now. Yeah. I, I, th I think that the whole reality of self-deception and hence the importance of the prophet, you know, yes. brought out perhaps in Amos 4, as I say, he, he attacks the cultured women of Samaria who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Yes. You know, in, in a sense, it's easy from that position high up uh, to ignore the needs of the people at the bottom. You probably don't even see them, you know what I mean? You probably uh, organise charitable picnic baskets every you know, a couple of times a year or something on the right festivals. And so we can just sort of put them out of our mind. And it, it takes the prophetic word 
to cut through and to yes. say, hang on a sec, you're actually exploiting the poor. Yes. Yes. And and, and I think in, in Islam and in, in particular in, in Shia Islam, uh, there is an, a very important um, parameter to this, which says that all of the prophets, all of the prophets, all and in Islam, we believe that there have been 124,000 prophets sent to humanity. 124,000. Mm. And all of those prophets are infallible. And it's a very, and, and you know, the, the reason why that is so important, especially from the Shia perspective, is that, well, God would not send you a prophet unless he was perfect. Mm. Because otherwise, on the day of judgment, you can turn around and say, well, I, I followed that example. And if you're telling me that example could have been wrong, well, how is that my fault? So God sends us these prophets as infallible this is of course the the, the shia islam uh ideas that, that he sends us these prophets as a pure source of knowledge and then unfortunately what happens is that once this knowledge now becomes disseminated by those who are not infallible and we one of the one of the really important things that in, in, in shia islam that we come to is that our religious authorities so even somebody as high ranking as a marja, and a marja in Islamic in Shia Islamic thought is almost like a papal figure or a head of a school of thought, very 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 important figure. And yet we're always reminded, and they remind us, we are not infallible. We can oh. make errors. We can make mistakes. So we are learned. We are educated. We we've given you the best that we can give you, but we're not we're not infallible. And I that is the difference between them and the prophets. Hmm. And it's the same. It's the same, you know, in, in um, um, Jewish or I suppose Christian reading of the Hebrew Bible as well with the prophets, that they are infallible. This is hmm. the infallible word of God. I think we yes. always accept that. Um, and some of the rulers went along with it. And, and, and in, as in this case with Jeroboam, some of them didn't and paid the price. Hmm. I think the um, I always get a bit confounded with this um, this uh, concept of the plumb line, but I think it um, it works very well in our readings today because I think we've got a plumb line in the gospel, haven't we? In terms of of um, that's a good point, brother. Staying straight, yeah. Mm. Look, let's let's move into the second reading, Dave, if we can. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. I'm going to, I'm going to remove. Um, this is a reading from um, the Apostle Paul's letter or epistle to the Colossians, uh, chapter one, beginning at the first verse. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of God on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Colossians. It's um, it's uh, it's uh, the way it's structured, and and but but mainly, I think it's kind of um, its tone, its rhythm, its incredible positivity. Uh, you know, I find it uh, I find it really uplifting. It's one of the it's one of the uh, of the epistles that um, that the scholars have cast doubt on in terms of whether or not Paul wrote it. For my money, I think he did write it. Um, it just seems a little different. They're saying, you know, from um, some of the others that he obviously did write. I don't think it really matters. And uh, and um, I know, you know, you and I have had this discussion before, Father Dave, um, some time back. Uh, I think it's it's um, it's gorgeous. You know, the way this this wonderful introduction. Um, of course, Paul's not around with them because I think he's again um, under under in, in prison. Um, he's been he's been locked up. Um, possibly in Rome at this time, um, but he's um, he's written this this um, this this wonderful letter, um, wishing them to be made um, you know strong in the faith and giving thanks to the Father, enabling them to share in the inheritance of the saints and the light, rescuing them and uh, and all of that, uh, and he um, he charges on into you know this incredible powerful description of 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 Christ as um, uh, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation and um, all the rest of it in that wonderful first chapter and finishes it all with um, some discussion of, of how they should live their lives, you know, how they should behave. Um, masters, be kind to your servants, servants, obey your masters and all that sort of thing. But um, it's got it's got great, great spirit, great spirit and, and uplift. It's really positive. It's uh, it's a joy to read, really. I, I, I too really quite enjoyed it. Obviously, it's the first time I've I've uh, had the opportunity to read that, and I, I, I think it is wonderfully positive. And uh, I think it's interesting uh, this whole idea as to whether or not uh, Paul actually wrote it. I think that if it, it's important to to look at the spirit of what is being said, and if the spirit is in line with uh, with, with the spirit of, of of the Bible in this case, or in our case, if it's in line with the spirit of the Quran, uh, then whether or not is important. It's obviously really important, but still, it's as long as it doesn't contradict or it doesn't go against what the spirit of the Bible of the Quran says, then it's something that you can obviously take a great deal of solace from and positivity from. And I think. Isn't that something we all need? A bit of that's positivity right. and solace. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, this is in terms of what I'm I'm saying now. It stems from some some doubt that I had at one time that uh, he he did write this. Um, you know, and I had a really good discussion with Father Dave um, about this. Um, you know, and in the end, you know, agreed that you know what does it what does it matter? Because it certainly is in line. Um, with uh, you know the good teaching, and it's mm. um, and it's also you know it's also terrifically written. You know it's um, it's um, it's it's a, it's wonderfully positively written. Um, you know, but it's good. It's written well, is is what I want to say. Whereas mm. you know, yeah, some of the other epistles are, don't quite come up to that sort of standard. But you know, mm. this is a this is a this is a great one. Mm. There's a wonderful book or collection of supplications uh, in Islam called Mafatih al-Jinan, uh, The Keys to the Heavens. And it's a, 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 there's been a, a great amount of debate as to whether or not all of, the, all of the supplications within that book can actually be attributed to the imams of the Ahlul Bayt. Right. And there are people that think absolutely 100%. There's no question here. I don't know why you're questioning it. But there are other scholars that say, well, look, you know, I mean, there are slight differences there. But even those, even those scholars will always stop and say, hey, there's absolutely nothing wrong in reading and reciting. They're wonderful. They're they're they're, they're right on the mark when it comes to uh, the the manner in which we should supplicate to God. But whether or not they're actually attributable to a particular imam, well, you know, th there is maybe some some reason to doubt. Uh, but at the end of the day. It's within the spirit, so supplicate away. Mm, mm, mm. 
and you you find it i mean in your in yourself in your prayerful relationship with god uh, as to in your or not the self uh, is father dave trying to come through i think so father dave doing my best i don't seem to be able to sorry you can't hear me can you no we, we can, can hear you just don't have an image yet well just in what we were saying uh mr baldwin I, I i think hearing him and not being able to see him you get this saintly figure sort of <laughs> being conjured up in the back of the mind there so <laughs> Quite so. <laughs> uh, dear. Mm. Yeah, some of um, some of Paul's uh, other letters are, you know, I mean, his best best known epistles are probably things like um, First Corinthians and 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 Romans, you know. And there's uh, there's a great there's a great power about those. They're the ones. So they're the ones that people know and um, and quote. Mm. But um, there's there's other great epistles as well, and this is one of them. Yes. In, in Islam, I guess we're we're a tiny bit luckier in that uh, the Quran in itself is undisputed. So whatever is in the Quran is, in the view of Muslims, the manifest word of God. However, the big sort of trip up that Muslims have is in the ahadith or in the sayings of the prophet. And there is actually an entire science which is built around the authenticity or the, or the authenticating of uh, the sayings of the prophet. And I, I have to say, this, this has been one of the great sort of dividing features uh between muslims because there are certain things which on the surface itself don't even appear to be in line with what the prophet would say and yet they're held in very high regard because it is said that they were transmitted by very reliable individuals and right. then so because of that now there's actually an entire study called ulum rijal which is the the study of the men and that is the men that translate these or or, or transmit these um oh, really right these, yeah so it's a very very in-depth science yeah yeah I'm, I'm back at last good to see you dave thank you brother yeah, yeah. And, and thank you for some wisdom here from uh, doug otherwise known as harry <laughs> <laughs> Now, he's referring to stuff there which I wasn't privy to, but I trust, um, love the advice regarding family and those closest to it. They must have come from you, Tom. I'm, I'm not sure. I'll, if it's good, I'll take it. I'm sorry I missed so much of that, but are we ready to move to the gospel reading? Yep. Mm. All right. Goodbye to you two gentlemen for the moment. Thankfully, I'm back. We're going to stand for the gospel. <clears throat> Holy Gospel is written in the 10th chapter of the Gospel coins of Luke, beginning at the 25th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, what do you read in it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. 
But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All right, my, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Even you must be familiar with that one, Tom. It's it's uh, absolutely yeah. It's it's a well, it's my favourite parable, and um, it taps into our Torah reading as well because the whole problem with the Samaritans. We were in Samaria in in the Torah reading. You'll remember, and Amos was prophesying against the Northern Kingdom that judgment was going to fall on them, and judgment does fall on them. Uh, in 721 BC, they're invaded by um, Assyria, aren't they? And uh, if you're familiar with the history there, what the Assyrians did to the northern kingdom of Israel was different from the way in which the Babylonians conquered southern Judah. Uh, the, the Assyrians had a very clever way of dealing with their conquests. Instead of sort of exporting the local population back to their own country as the Babylonians did, with the southern Judah, they imported their own people into countries they conquered. So they, a whole lot of Assyrians would migrate into Samaria and that meant that the bloodline was diluted. So that local Assyrians would marry local uh, Jews in Samaria and over time that'd be a, a racial hodgepodge, you know, so every, there'd be no purity of bloodlines and that would stop uh, revolt against the Assyrian Empire because a lot of the people there were now Assyrian and it, what that meant from the point of view of the southern Judeans was that these people were no longer true Jews and no longer truly a part of their community and uh, that their culture and practices became sort of half Jewish, half Assyrian and uh, hence the Samaritan Torah finishes at the end of the book of Deuteronomy because that's as far as they got. Anyway, the, the, they become the sort of half-brothers and sisters, sort of, and uh, j just as the Protestants always hated the Catholics and the Catholics the Protestants and the Shia, the Sunni and the Sunni, you know, you, you get this sort of deep divide between these sort of half-brothers and sisters. And so this, when the, the Samaritan shows up, to see the wounded man, you think, well, he's got enough problems without a Samaritan showing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, it's very powerful. Whole point. It, it's very powerful. I mean, I, I've always taken uh, the, the the adage of do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. And I, I, I've, I, I'm really not sure who this is attributed to, but I saw a variation of this, which I thought was, was equally wonderful. And it says, do unto others as you would want God to do unto you on the day of judgment. And the only thing I think any of us, any of us, no matter what we subscribe to, what we adhere to, the only thing that any of us want on the day of judgment is God's mercy. Mercy. And mercy. if we can't show mercy to others, then why should we expect God to show mercy to us? And I think that's the litmus test. That's that's where we, you know, we 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 begin to understand the grace of God. Beautifully put. Yeah, I require mercy, not sacrifice. I think Jesus quotes that three times in the Gospels. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. There's another wonderful Christian theologian uh, and philosopher, uh, a guy called Professor Cornell West. And he, he starts just about every single one of his lectures by saying, you know, I am who I am because somebody loved me, somebody cared for me, somebody attended to me. And I, I've had a really good think about that. And I think if I was to make a, a humble little 
adage to that. It would be, I am who I am because somebody loved me, cared for me, and attended to me. Now, who will say that about me? And I yeah. think, really, that's that's really what it's got to come down to. You know, this own ownership of wanting to be the Samaritan to somebody else. Yeah, I, I don't want to, to bypass it. If, if you read my newsletter this week, you know I've already talked about this, but um, the whole, something very relevant to us, the, the way in which this parable speaks to the reality of tribalism. Mm. Because the, you know, as, as I, it, it, hear, hearing sermons on this so many times, why did the priest and Levite pass by on the other side? You know, there you've got two good religious people. Why would they ignore this man? They know they're supposed to care. Well, it's because they can't tell whether he's one of us or one of them. Right. Uh, the, the point, that's what Stephen Sizer pointed out to me years ago, my, my dear friend in London, when we were in Iran together. He was pulled me aside and he said, you know that parable? He said, we're always wondering why did um, the priest and Levite pass by on the other side? It's, it's because he couldn't, because the man was naked and unconscious. Because he's naked and unconscious, you can't tell his nationality. This is how we tell whether someone's one of us or one of them. It's by their accent. It's by the way they dress. And so this man has been left naked and unconscious they can't tell if he's Jewish or not. And that's, you remember, it goes back to the lawyer saying, well, who is my neighbour? And the obvious answer is, well, your fellow Jew, mm. a fellow member of your tribe. Who's my neighbour? Your fellow Christian, who's your neighbour? Your fellow Shia? And so Jesus says, here, let me tell you a story. Mm. And the yeah. story is about the man who's beaten up and there he is naked and unconscious and the guys walking by, they can't tell, is he one of us or is he one of them? Yes. Yes. They can't hear his accent. They can't see the way he's dressed. They don't know if he's Jewish or, or Roman or Greek or Palestinian. And if he's not one of us, he's somebody else's problem. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So the, the whole point of the Samaritan, he looks at the man. Is he one of? Is he a fellow Samaritan? Is he somebody else? He doesn't know and he doesn't care. Yes. And this is the go and do likewise from Jesus is move beyond the us and them, move beyond yeah. the tribalism that yeah. divides us. Uh, yeah, that, that's our plumb line something. now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's our plumb line now. Um, yes. From the, from, the, uh, from the Good Samaritan. And I think, you know, I think your friend Stephen made um, a fantastic discovery there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, um, it really meant a lot to me, and it means a lot to me in terms of um, the Bible being like um, almost like an, uh, uh, an Agatha Christie novel, you know, it's there's stuff there that's to be discovered, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. There's important stuff to be discovered. Um, you know, we just we just have to wait for these things to come to us, you know. And I think it's a that's a prime example of that, you know. I mean, this um, man was left naked on the road. You know, he didn't have any clothes on, so they couldn't tell whose tribe he belonged to. So those first two passed by. In, in in Islam, we've got a very similar um, uh, situation here uh, that, that's attributable directly to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, uh, in which uh, the, the Prophet was walking with his companions and they come across a blind, elder, very, you know, very old man, destitute on the side of the street. And the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, stops and he says, well, what is the condition of this man? And they say to him, well, don't worry about him. He's, he's, he's one of the Christians from the area. And he said, well, we were, we were happy to use his energies and his skills when he was younger. And, and now we're just happy to throw him away. And he makes them feed and clothe him from the money of the treasury directly from the making the example that these people are to be looked after by the Islamic treasury and not by simply the charity of so it became institutionalized so again very very similar example there mm. Mm. <laughs> it's yours joy <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting. You reminded me, Dan, Dan, Daniel Veer said that the parables are like windows, that we we look through them, we see the world in a different way, and then all of a sudden we catch our reflection. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's I'm, similar I'm way in which more discoveries to be made. I'm going to need, have to leave you now. Um, that is thank a great show. And, um, and it's been wonderful.
God bless you, Thank Dave. You again. God it bless has you. been wonderful. So beyond us and them, Dave, beyond tribalism and learning we to will, love. We will, we will go and do likewise. Inshallah. Won't we, sisters? God bless you, Dave. God bless you, brothers. Thank you. And you, Tom, I'll, I'll uh, say goodbye for the moment. Thank you if so you're much, still with Dave. Us, come back and uh, we'll, we'll share. I'm, I'm going to have to skedaddle, do. I've got to go visit some family for the Eid. So um, God bless. And um, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was wonderful. Eid Mubarak, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Salam. Salam. There you are, a good example of um, moving beyond tribalism. I mean, what we believe is what we believe, and we're about to affirm that in the words of the creed. But who is my neighbour? Who is my brother? And remember, in, in the New Testament context, uh, who is my neighbour, who is my brother, who is my sister? Uh, they're the same uh, terms, same concept. The... Uh, for most of Jesus' hearers, who is my brother? Who is my sister? Who is my neighbor? Well, your fellow Jew, the fellow member of your tribe, your fellow Christian, your fellow Muslim, your fellow... No. <laughs> we can be bigger than that. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Who was the neighbor? Who acted like a neighbor? The person who helped, who loved, 